Park bench wings, chassis mount splitters, side skirts that slice your ankles up every time you get in and out of the car. Aero is nothing new when it comes to the automotive world. We've seen it evolve through the decades and watched it make its way from the track to some cars that will never even see a track. But like those cars, is it all just for show or is it actually essential? And more importantly, how does it work? When we look back into the history of racing, there is a period of time where these cars started to get pretty damn fast. So fast, in fact, that the speed of these cars weren't necessarily restricted by the power they were putting down, but by how they handled at high speeds. This was happening right around the late 60s and into the early 70s, with Lotus actually being the first to bring any sort of front wing to the 1968 Monaco Grand Prix with the 49B. To the aero wars that were happening stateside with NASCAR between Ford and Chrysler, leading to the introduction of the Dodge Daytona in the Plymouth Superbird, with their iconic large rear towering wing. Experimentation with aero exploded throughout the early 70s, especially in the world of Formula One, introducing larger front wings, rear wings, side pods, and much more. Today, aero plays a crucial role for these racing teams and their cars, which can be seen by looking at any picture of a modern Formula One car. But what does this all do? When it comes to talking about how aero affects the performance of a vehicle, we are going to be focusing on two main things. The first one being aerodynamic pressure, otherwise known as downforce, and the second being drag. Starting with aerodynamic pressure, it's important to know what it is and how it works. So get ready because we're gonna dive in head first into the basic laws of aerodynamics. Don't worry, I'll keep it simple, but you better be taking notes because we're gonna have a test on this later. The first thing we need to understand is the Bernoulli principle. Now, Mr. Daniel Bernoulli was a very smart man, and he found that when you increase the speed of a fluid, or air in this case, because it's all the same, a decrease in static pressure will occur at the same time. Now, stick with me here. Essentially, what this proves or shows us is how lift works. Let's look at the cross section of the wing of an aircraft, also known as an airfoil. You will notice that the top section of the airfoil bows upward where the bottom will remain generally flat. This gives the oncoming air a further path to travel over the top side of the airfoil versus the bottom. No matter what, the oncoming air will meet at the trailing edge of this airfoil at the same time, meaning that the air that's moving over the top side of the wing will have to move faster, creating low pressure on the top and high pressure on the bottom, generating lift. Got it? Cool. There's your quick crash course on the basics of lift. But you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I thought aero provided downforce on cars. Wouldn't this just like lift them off the ground? And you're right, it would. But if you were to take that same airfoil and turn it upside down, and you look at the cross section of an airfoil of a GT wing, for instance, you will see that it's the same thing. It's essentially an upside down wing. Still creating lift, but in the opposite direction. Bernoulli principle is the basis to almost every piece of aero you will find on a car, and the reason as to why it works. Generating downforce is what helps keep these cars planted and controlled at high speeds. But there's another factor that engineers and race teams need to keep in mind when it comes to adding aero to a car. And that, of course, is the second part of this, which is drag. Now, drag goes hand in hand with aero and aerodynamic pressure. Anytime you disrupt the natural flow of air over a car with a wing, for instance, you will also be creating drag. The balance between providing enough downforce but not too much drag is a constant battle that engineers fight. While more drag and downforce can help keep your car planted, it can also limit the top speed due to the amount of drag that's produced. This is why balancing aerodynamic pressure throughout the entire car is super important and why you see so many pieces throughout the entire car, which is exactly what we're going to talk about next. What role do all of these parts play? Starting with the most common and unfortunately the most misunderstood piece of aero, wings and spoilers. Now I did say two different things there because there is a difference. A wing like we talked about before has an actual airfoil to it that uses a Bernoulli principle to generate downforce. A spoiler on the other hand creates downforce by spoiling the airflow and creating drag or a high pressure area on the rear end of a car. The purpose of both of these is of course to create downforce at the rear of the car, but they each work in their own different ways. Typically spoilers will look like a thing like your duck bill or gurney flap and are a fixed item. Wings, on the other hand, may be adjustable. Increasing or decreasing the angle of attack of it will change the amount of downforce or drag that the wing is making. Keeping aerodynamic pressure balanced throughout the car is very important. The back may be planted with a wing or a spoiler, but now you have the front that still wants to lift off the ground, which is why we also have things such as splitters and canards. A proper splitter will create drag in a high pressure area near the front of the car. 
And this high pressure area or down force is created to keep the front of that car planted and keep it from lifting up. Now typically paired along with a splitter are things known as canards or dive plates. And these are typically attached to the outer ends of a splitter or attached to the side of the bumper. Now these are added to eventually direct that high pressure air away from the front of the car and let it flow throughout the rest of the vehicle. A proper wing and splitter to match is a great place to start when it comes to your aero. And that goes for any car, no matter the drivetrain. I know the internet seems to think that wings on front wheel drive cars tend to be pointless, but that really couldn't be further from the truth. The only time it becomes useless is when you never take the car over 40 miles an hour. But of course it goes even further than wings and splitters. Aero can be beneficial in places that you don't even necessarily see, like the underside of your car. If you were to take a look at the bottom of a supercar, Formula One car, or time attack car, you will notice that the underside has just as much attention to detail as any other exterior modification. This comes in the form of underbody panels and diffusers. Remember, air Air is flowing all around your car, underneath, just as much as the top. And when you have things like transmission tunnels, braces, and the unibody shape of modern vehicles, you get a lot of pockets in areas that will cause drag in high pressure areas, which is not what you want. By covering these areas with smooth panels and reducing as much turbulence and drag as possible, you create high velocity, low pressure air that moves underneath the car, pretty much making the entire car suction to the ground. The key here, however, is keeping that air moving at a high velocity. And directing it exactly where it needs to go, which is out the back of the car. Now this is where diffusers come into play. Now diffusers have quite an interesting role when it comes to aerodynamics. Instead of creating downforce in the way that wings and spoilers and splitters do, diffusers rely on something called the Venturi effect. Now the Venturi effect is when a fluid's pressure decreases as its speed increases. Now, this happens when it's put through a constricted section. What does that mean? It means that the diffuser takes incoming air, turns it into high velocity, low pressure air, and then returns it to low velocity, high pressure air. I know that was a lot, just hang with me. Diffusers are able to accomplish this with the areas that are built into them. The most important of the two being the throat and the tunnel. The throat is a part of the diffuser that restricts that incoming airflow, turning it into that high velocity, low pressure air that will create downforce. The second part is the tunnel that slows the air velocity and recovers that high pressure air to disperse towards the rear of the vehicle. Now, Ferris Engineering actually has a fantastic article and breakdown on how diffusers work, in which I would definitely recommend checking out if you want to learn more about it. But in simple terms, what a diffuser does, it helps create additional low pressure area under the car to help act as a vacuum to suction the car to the ground. Now, when you pair all this, the splitter, underbody panels, and even side skirts to help keep the air from escaping the side of the vehicle, these pieces can have a drastic impact on how a car handles at high speed, showing how they all work together and why it's important to look at how all of this balances out throughout the entire car. But just like everything else, when it comes to building a high performance vehicle, aero comes with its own importance and understanding to make it worthwhile. And when it's done properly, it can provide noticeable improvements on pretty much any car. Now, I know that was just a ton of nerd information that I just threw your way. So if you made it this far in the video, first of all, thanks for sticking around, I appreciate it. And second, if you have any other questions about Aero or are looking for some for your car, feel free to let us know. And remember to mod your car at Martin.